This week on the Men at the Movies podcast, we celebrate our 100th episode by deep diving into Top Gun Maverick. In part one, we break down two of the main themes. It's not the plane, it's the pilot. When we go beyond our limitations, God steps in. And all you've done is show them that it can't be done. We aren't called to create believers everywhere we go, teaching them how to behave. Jesus invited us to make disciples, walking with others to reflect who we are. Strap on your helmet and let's discover God's truth in this movie. The movies and stories we love are gateways to see ourselves and God in new ways. Every great story borrows its power from a larger story, the story that's written on our hearts and woven into the fabric of our very being. Hello and welcome to the Men at the Movies podcast. My name is Paul McDonald and I want to welcome you to our 100th episode of this podcast. And before I bring in my guest this week, I want to take a minute and thank everyone who's been listening and supportive of the podcast, the website, and even our new YouTube channel. We also have a Patreon page where you get to directly support our work and get some additional cool Men at the Movies swag. This month, we're sending our investors a unique Men at the Movies logo sticker for Halloween designed by me and Ian Johnston. And if you choose to support us through Patreon, you'll get invited to participate in a monthly live recording, access to special quarterly episodes, diving into series or TV shows, maybe even an invite onto the podcast. I've got lots of cool stuff in there and we're always adding to it. So check it out at patreon.com backslash men at the movies. Now, when Andreas and I sat down to discuss this movie, We had no plan to break it into two parts, but the conversation was so much fun and so rich that we couldn't contain it all. And even that wasn't enough. We'll have a conversation on our YouTube channel where we dive into the scene with Val Kilmer, talking about why that moment was so important and what we got out of it. So check us out on our YouTube channel at Men at the Movies. So that's been enough of this intro. Let's get into our conversation. And joining me, celebrating our 100th episode, is my friend Andreas Werner. Hello. Hello. <laughs> German in name, but not in accent. Ah, the gates. <laughs> Are you going to do the whole podcast in German with a German tinge to your voice? I don't think I could pull that off. <laughs> I don't think I'm good enough for that. I'll try. It, it, was, it was a difficult choice for the 100th episode of the Men at the Movies podcast. Because, you know, most of most of this is with Brit. We did our 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 uh, our anniversary edition. We did Shawshank Redemption with with me and Brit and Patrick and Ricky all together in a room. But when I asked those guys for their options for the what like what movies do you think we should we should do, and their suggestions were some of them included movies I had not heard of. I think this is the hundredth episode. This should be a movie that you're like, oh man, I want to hear that one. And so I thought Top Gun Maverick. Here we are. Just now out on streaming, available to buy. So good. And Andreas and I saw this together like the opening week. It was very soon after it came out. Yeah. And went out and had lunch and talked about it for three hours. I wished I had a little portable recorder because I would I could have just edited that conversation. Just for the record, that was a terrible experience. We went and saw it in 4D, <laughs> which is like these seats that move. And you're like, oh, this is going to be such a good idea because when the plane moves, then yeah. then we'll move with the plane. And I just wanted to like throw up the whole time. I was yeah. I was smart. I'm like, oh, I'll have a beer or something beforehand. And it just, it it was, look, by the end of the movie, I'm like, oh, I just want to so go home. I'm so glad this is over. <laughs> I'm so glad this is over. <laughs> yeah, we were thrown around. It was It was much more action- yeah. In the seats than I thought there would be. Yeah. Although I will say that the sailing episode with like the sailing and the, like, that was awesome. That yeah. Was a so friend cool. of mine, I told him about it. He's like, what do you think was in the water? Oh man. Cause why you- <laughs> I, was like, I know health department regulations. It's like, why do you got to ruin it? It was pretty cool. That in the scene, by the way, yeah. spoiler alerts Uh-oh. are will abound. So yes. if you don't want us to spoil Top Gun Maverick for you, you probably should turn it off and wait. But the scene where the helicopter comes around and 
lit up. Oh, that fabric, was so good. Yeah. And the lights are coming and we have the little air puffs shooting. Yeah. They had like a little air jets shooting at your legs and <laughs> yeah. at your neck and stuff. And that was awesome. Cause it felt like there were bullets. Yeah, it felt like that we were bad hiding cool. behind a tree. Yeah. That was, that was fun. So I'm feeling like uh, Chris Farley in the, uh, remember that time in the movie? <laughs> that was awesome. And, uh, but no. So when I thought of Top Gun Maverick, I had to, it had to be Andreas because Andreas, how many times now have you estimated seeing this oh, movie? Oh man, this is like an embarrassing number. All right. So I, I've seen it six times in the theater and then it came out, what, a week or two ago on streaming and I've probably seen it another four times. Right. So. I that, mean, I've seen number. it four, which I feel like is pretty good. I saw it first weekend with my son and then you, I was like, oh man, I got to go see this again. And, and so you and I went and saw it Yeah. in the uh, nauseating, Golly. throwing us around, take your Motrin. Yeah, that was rough. 4d <laughs> and then uh when i when we for this podcast i was like oh, i gotta watch it again yeah so i bought it yep and watched it with my son again because mm. he's like oh we should watch it again yes. and then my wife was upset because we were waiting for her to watch it and then she's like oh, i thought we were gonna watch it so then i had to watch it i had to you had air to. quotes you had to i had to it sounds I did, like it's not, i didn't have to times. i got to <laughs> what a gift here you are what a gift so I'm, and you know, I might end up watching it again because uh, after after listening to this, I might get all excited. By the way, if you haven't seen it and you're still listening, seriously, go go buy it. It's worth the twenty bucks, you know, and then watch it whenever you want, as many times as you want, and one time investment as opposed to paying multiple times to go see it in the theaters. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I think I was I was born in eighty two, so I, I was probably eight or nine years old, and my uh, my mom and dad were going on some date someplace and they left me with my grandparents. And when they did that, they said, Hey, we, we got a movie. They can go ahead and watch it. And it was a documentary about aviation and they put it in and it's Top Gun. I'm just, I'm sorry. I probably should have said that. <laughs> and, uh, and so I sat there and as like an eight or nine year old kid, I remember watching this movie and just absolutely falling in love with it and loving everything about it. And then I stopped watching it when I was in high school, because why would I watch Top Gun in my high school? And, uh, now that I'm an adult, like I went back and I watched the original movie again, it hits me totally different for different reasons. And I love it. But the Top Gun franchise has always been like the one on my list. So right. it's for me, this is, this is something that I'm really excited about and I'm glad to be here. Yeah. And so that's why I was like, I, this is a great movie for a hundredth episode. Don't worry. I'll bring in Brit and maybe Patrick and Ricky for the, the second anniversary coming up here in a few weeks. But I wanted to do a knock it out of the park movie. And Top Gun Maverick hits all, checks all the boxes, yeah, as they does. say. Mm -hmm. So, and I had to bring, if I'm doing this movie, I had to bring in Andreas because he just talked about how much he loved the franchise. We're going to start with the big question. And, and if you haven't listened, Britt and I did a podcast on the original Top Gun for our summer blockbuster series back in 21. Go check that out because we talk a lot about the orphan spirit of Pete Mitchell and the true identity of Maverick and how that, became that uh, as that became a wholehearted person through the course of that movie, which then leads into this one. So when you're looking at the Top Gun franchise, why did you love Top Gun, the original? And then why, why do you love this movie? Why I'm not even gonna say, why did we pick this movie? I've talked about why we picked this movie, but why do you love this, these films? Okay. Well, let me start where it started, which is yeah. when I was a child, uh, my I was parents, born at an early age. At a, at a very early age, I was born. <laughs> uh, I don't remember it, but it happened. My parents, um, specifically my father, always had this notion of being the best of the best. And as an adult, I realized that it's affected my life a little bit. <laughs> really? It has. The way your father looked at life affected yours. Uh, affect, yeah, who knew? So it's Shocking. Shocking. So... When I was growing up, I, he was my soccer coach. And so every practice, we would drive home after practice, and he would say, hey, what could he have done better? And as had a very similar father experience, I yeah, think. Yeah, so good. <laughs> but that stuff stuck with me, right? Yeah. So between having my dad talk to me that way and then me being actually fairly decent at soccer, uh, I was always like, how do I improve? How do I improve? How do I improve? How do I improve? And now I, I kind of work in the business world, and we have things called retrospectives, and that's the exact same thing, but you do it as a group, right? <laughs> right. 
But you're getting onto the lean processing and Six Sigma. How exactly. do we improve? How do we improve? How do we improve? Lord, no waste. None. <laughs> But it still affects my. If it my... doesn't bring you joy, through it. No, that's something different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's funny though because as as an adult, like it still affects me. Like before COVID, when I was driving into the office, you know, I would drive into the office, and then as I was parking my car, I'd reflect. Okay, well, did I do that good enough? Were there any lane changes that could have been more efficient? Could I have taken a turn smoother than I did? Right. And so, so this for all of, your project management needs, dude, contact I'm telling Andreas. You, it's so bad. Like my my self criticalness inside my head is just it's always going. And so with my experience with this movie, it connected that right. It connected my dad's feelings on the world with kind of how I saw things and my own success. And so as a child, that's what I loved about it. And then as I became an adult. Uh, it became more along the lines of when you're living life, things are going to happen and you may or may not have control about it, but what you do have control of is how you respond. Mm. And so the theme changed for me as a child compared to being an adult and then going into this next movie, you know, it's, it's similar components, but they're talked about differently. And I love the way that Top Gun Maverick took the same fundamental components of the first movie and used those to its advantage where I feel like a lot of sequels will fall short, right? Cause they're very derivative. Well, let's just follow the same formula. Yeah. Well, Top Gun Maverick does that. Well, it you look it. at the star Wars and then the last Jedi, the force awakens very similar themes yes. and framework, but the way they did it was unique. And I think the same thing, like you were, we were talking before, like we've been talking for over an hour. We had lunch after it. We talked for three hours. We talked for an hour before we started hit the record button. So we've been talking about this a lot, but what, what you said was they're basically the same movie, but just packaged differently. Yeah. I mean, so just to, just to review, and if you haven't seen the first or the second movie, sorry, here's the entire plot. <laughs> you're going to, you're going to have uh, a really cool opening scene on an aircraft carrier. And then it's going to go to Maverick. Maverick's in a, some type of life or death situation. His ego causes some things to happen. There's some type of failure. He gets punished for it. He gets sent off to go to Top Gun to do Top Gun things. Once he's there, he shows up to a bar, makes an ass of himself. <laughs> Next day, he shows up to training. He pays for consequences of someone making making a fool of themselves the night before. Then they go off and they start doing their, their two two stages of, of, uh, of training. I'm, I guess it's actually three stages, right? So a three stages of training. The first one is, you know, me against you. Let's see if you have what it takes. And then you have your second training session. Your second training session is, is, is all right. Uh, there's some kind of workout scene where people aren't wearing shirts, right? Some, you got to be on the beach. You got to be on the beach. You got to be playing beach volleyball, whatever yeah. it might be. At least you didn't have a four foot volleyball net. Yeah. Th these are things that help, right? <laughs> and then, uh, poor, poor Tom Cruise, <laughs> <laughs> poor guy. I'm not sure. I don't sure <laughs> poor and Tom Cruise go in the same sentence. Well, he made it work for him, right? Yeah, so that, that's good. For sure. I'm glad he I'm glad he found success. Right. <laughs> then you have a second training mission. Things go wrong. A plane crashes. Someone dies. There's a funeral. There's some type of turmoil that happens. Maverick may or may not be blamed. Uh, a turn of events takes place. He goes on. This, he questions who he is. He questions who he is. He has a little existential crisis. He ends up going on this final mission. There's a climax. Uh, and then, you know, I'm not going to talk about how it ends. Well, I guess I'm going to talk about it. It's better not right now. Not right now. But so it's, it's very formulaic, right? But yeah. the way that it does it is so cool to me because you have the same, you have the same path, but, or you have a similar milestones, but the paths are different. And so yeah. it's almost like you have two hiking trails and they hit the exact same mile markers, but they're two independent trails that kind of just run parallel to each other and they touch base and, and they tell the story differently, right? It's a different experience, but you still hit the same milestones. And I think, I think that it was masterful in the way they did it. Mm. And the way that they did it, in spite of not having Tony Scott to direct it, I think was also masterful. And I think it's one of the reasons why the movie was so successful was because they had to take extra special care in terms of how the story was told and how the story was shot. And ah, 10 out of 10, loved it. Absolutely loved the movie. So stuff that I've read about it, Back when they first did the original Top Gun, Tom Cruise was bummed because most of it was sort of done in a flight simulator. And and he's like, if I'm going to do that, if I'm going to do this movie again, if I'm going to do make this sequel, it's going to be real. Because Tom Cruise was the only actor that could handle actually being in an airplane. Yeah. So there's this article I read. I'll put 
links in the uh, on on our website menatthemovies.com backslash podcasts where it will talk we'll talk the articles from the ringer and they just it's these actors talking about going through flight school with mm. Tom Cruise and like you see in some of the shots where their faces are misshapen because <laughs> of the G forces that they're going through and they actually had to fight yeah blacking out and learn how to to handle all that pressure yeah and you know throwing up that <laughs> happened a lot <laughs> hey, if I had eleven thousand hours an hour or eleven thousand dollars an hour to pet, spend on something, I would absolutely fly an F eighteen for the purpose of making a movie. Like, uh, yeah, way to way to use your funds well, right. Tom. Good right. job. And who didn't? I mean, we grew up at about the same time. Who didn't want to be a fighter pilot? Yeah, right. That was that was my dream. My when I was younger, I had uh, I I enjoyed making model airplanes, mm. and I would hang. I, I'd have hooks in the ceilings with fishing line and hang different models above my room. So I had like an F-15. That was my favorite plane ever. It's a solid plane. And I'd have uh, Airwolf for all you ch ch children of the 80s, mm. um, painted correctly. But the, the my sort of the, the prize possession was like a three foot long SR-71 Blackbird. Oh, man. That hung over my bed. Oh, man. And Three feet? That's yeah. huge. It was, it was massive and it's awesome. And I, I, I have some, I saw you looking at some of the planes here in the office. He's got some F-18s up here that are yeah. models. Well, and I would, I, my plan was to do the same thing mm. and hang them up here in my, my study. I call oh, it a study. It sounds better than an office. No, it's, it's definitely a study. Yeah. And, but you can't, like they're designed to sit. Like you can't, you can't build the models with the landing gear up. Hmm. Or the canopy down. Oh, interesting. Like there is all like here, do this. And then you put the ladder and then like what? Which yeah. is kind of frustrating because when I moved, we moved when I was 15 mm -hmm. and yep. A 15 year old had models, <laughs> loved it, whatever. That's I was good. homeschooled. <laughs> <laughs> and he, Andreas has three boys who are homeschooled. So yeah. I can, I can say that. <laughs> and by the way, now it's much cooler than it was back in the, 80s being homeschooled or early 90s yeah we moved from uh this little town in georgia up to clemson and in the move every single one of my models was busted oh no i was i was i was crushed i was like that was that was the first of many traumas in my life just like your models <laughs> yes <laughs> i was broken in half just like my sr-71 <laughs> blackbird uh so yeah, so yeah, we've talked a long time without this. So welcome to our past. Where this is therapy. Here we are. Paul and Andreas. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to our child. But it, like you said, this, this movie connects us with our childhood. Mm -hmm. You hear Andreas was just playing the theme song on the piano, on my out-of-tune piano here in, in the bottom of my house. And like it was tough when I hit the the play button for our theme music. I was like, no, I want <laughs> that's what I wanted coming out. Oddly enough, that came out of nine year old Andreas's piano era back when my parents had me playing <laughs> playing music. And they're like, hey, whatever music you want. I'm like, I want to play Top Gun. And they're like, all right, well here's some sheet music for Top Gun. So I learned to play it on piano at nine years old. So yeah, what you saw is for 30 years old, right? <laughs> well, well done. That Thanks. was pretty good. <laughs> yeah. The also, the piano much older than 30 years and sounded like it. So we are going to talk about the actual movie. Eventually. Eventually. <laughs> because, as you mentioned, the, the, the movies hit the same beats mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Yep. Which, and you said, this Maverick, Top Gun Maverick, stands alone. It's a movie, if you've never seen Top Gun, you can see the second one. Absolutely. But if you've seen the first... Yep. It makes the first one so much better. Oh, man. A lot. Which I think I'm reading through the Bible this year. If you've never read the Old Testament, <laughs> the New Testament makes sense. But if you read the Old Testament looking at the New Testament, it makes the Old Testament hit that much better. Yeah. It's got a lot more deeper, a lot more meaning behind it. It does. So one of the things, the recurring themes that we see in the movie is it's not the plane, it's the pilot. Rooster says it. Tom Cruise says it. That's he says it to the drone ranger. So, what is it about that concept 
that hits for you? So that phrase is used two different times in the movie. Um, the first time it's used when Rooster is like, hey, I'll just go slow through the canyon and then I'll pull up and Mav's like, hey, you're not going to have time because you're going to be waiting for fifth generation fighters and Sam's that are going to come after you at the same time. And he's like, yeah, but it's it's not the plane, it's the pilot. And Mav's like, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you don't got what it takes, kid. Right. Right. I'm sorry. You're not the dude to survive this. And it's true, right? Like, he, he, his plane gets shot down, right? He, he doesn't survive that. There's, his plane doesn't survive that interaction. Um, at the same point in time, later on in the movie, uh, and I'll talk about this a little later, uh, it's set again, right? What's interesting, though, is that planes are built for purposes. And so the F-14 was built, uh, I think it came in production in 74, and it was a product of the Korean War. The original War. Tomcat? Yeah, the original Tomcat. So when the original Tomcat entered service, it was actually designed as a result of the Korean War. And Soviets had created a plane that could uh, sink a carrier and they could do it from outside the range of an F-4 Phantom, which at the time was the plane that the U.S. Navy was using to protect their, their carriers. And so the F-14 was created to be a long-range air superiority fire, fighter. And the Phoenix missile system that it carries, when it shoots, it actually launches the missiles up into the upper atmosphere. And the missiles actually come down on top of the planes after going for about 100 miles. And so it's a long-range, high-speed fighter that's meant to take things out from range. And also some reconnaissance, right? So it goes, what, Mach 2.3, I think, is a high-speed. So 10 years later, you have the Vietnam War, right? In the Vietnam War, you have uh, air-to-air fighters, and then you also have air-to-ground, right? And so the F-18 was created as a response to that because now you now you have the F-14, but it needs to be tighter. It needs to be able to attack. It needs to be able to carry air-to-ground stuff. It needs to be able to be more versatile. And then that's why the F-18 was created, right? So the F-18 was created in response to a different war in a different purpose. You fast forward, the Su-57s are an air superiority fighter, right? They're meant to go extremely fast. They're not meant to be seen on radar, right? It's a different type of warfare. And so you have... Uh, these kind of Cold War era planes that were built for different purposes. And then you have, they're going up against this this plane. It's a fifth generation air superiority fighter. It's a distinct purpose for why it was created was to shoot down other planes. The exact same reason why we have our F-22, which smokes the Su-57. And so you have two planes that if they were to go up head to head, have absolutely no business coming out on top and winning, Right. And you see these articles about pilots responding. They're like, yeah, I mean, I suppose it could be the pilot, but you don't understand. Like there is so much power and so much precision and so much electronic warfare that's built into these things. Like if you have a fourth gen fighter, you're, you're not, you're not meant to survive that interaction. That's why the United States of America is able to base our currency on hopes and dreams in our market instead of actual value is because we have enough defense that we can defend all of our trade routes and, <laughs> and allies. Right. So, you know, we, we have this, we have this plane that has a purpose. And so the F-18 is meant to fly in. It, it only goes like what Mach 1.8, I think is a high speed, uh, super tiny. It's a one seater, uh, super maneuverable, way more maneuverable than an F-8, uh, than an F-14. Uh, and then that, that plane is going up against a plane that was meant to shoot that plane out of the sky. Right. Right. So um, you, you have this moment, and then the question is, how do you, as a pilot, go against that? And the way that Top Gun Maverick responds to that is you don't, right? You have to fly below the SAMs. You have to, you have to do it. You have to get to your target so fast that those plans can't catch you, right? Our only way to combat this is by not fighting at all. So we're going to structure mm. this entire mission around avoiding that potential uh, cataclysmic interaction where you don't right. come home. Right. That's and what so Mav says at the beginning, somebody's not coming home. Exactly. Someone's not coming home. And so when you have that moment, it's like, Hey, it's, it's not the plane, it's the pilot. It's like, look, you have to be an exceptional, absolutely exceptional pilot to figure out how to go up against a fifth gen plane and win. Now 
lucky for us, Rush only has seven. And after Top Gun, I think it's only five now, right? So <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> we don't know what country this was. We are just roughly, they don't ever say the country. They don't say what kind of plane it is. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a... Uh, you know, it's it's interesting. So you get to this the pilot in the seat, right? And you could have the best pilot in the world, and they're still not going to come out and win against these planes. And so even though as craftsmen, right, like a carpenter, you know, you wouldn't say, oh, it's it's not the tool, it's the carpenter. It's like, yeah, you know, you give a, a skilled carpenter and you say, hey, you got to make this, and I'm going to give you a handsaw and a hammer, and that's it. They'll figure out a way to do it, right? Because they have the skill and experience to make that right. happen. And at the end of the movie, they dive into that, right? And you start to explore that that final climactic scene with how Maverick deals deals with that. But the time leading up to that, he's not meant to win that fight, and no one's meant to win that fight. So then, how do you, as a pilot, respond to an overwhelming interaction where you're not meant to win? Right. And I think this movie discusses that beautifully. Which, again, not over spiritualizing, but frequently, that's how God works. We're called into battles that, according to the world standards, we're not meant to win. You know, Malcolm Gladwell talked about David and Goliath in his book, David and Goliath. He talked about how we look at it as David's this big underdog, but according to the skills of the day, David being proficient with a slingshot actually meant he was one of the best warriors. He was one of the best weapons they had. But then you look at Gideon. Oh, no, you've got 30,000 men. You need to cut it to 300. You have to face overwhelming odds because otherwise, if you don't, then you'll think it was you that did it, not me. And this whole movie talks about the importance of the pilot or the impact of the pilot. Even in the beginning, you know, uh, Ed Harris's character, the drone ranger. He's like, drones are the future. Unmanned flights, that's where we're heading. Because I don't have a pilot who's not going to obey orders. <laughs> and I'll actually play a scene here. One of the most important things when you're looking at the importance of the pilot, the importance of the man in the box, is knowing your limitations. What are our limitations? As you mentioned, the F-18 has certain structural it can only go so fast. Mm -hmm. It can only withstand too many Gs. Like I said, you've <laughs> done irreparable damage to that thing by proving you, you could run through the course, Maverick. Yeah. You know, he did it in 215, but can't use that plane again because it's probably bent out of shape. Right. And when Maverick shows up to teach, he has a manual. He's been introduced because I think for us, it's frequently easy to look at the manual look at what the world says and to measure ourselves by that versus what God has put inside us. Your instructor is a Top Gun graduate with real world experience in every mission aspect you will be expected to master. His exploits are legendary and he's considered to be one of the finest pilots this program has ever produced. What he has to teach you may very well mean the difference between life and death. I give you Captain Pete Mitchell. Call sign, Maverick. Good morning. The F-18 Natops contains everything they want you to know about your aircraft. I'm assuming you know the book inside and out. Damn right. Yeah, Damn straight. you got it. So does your enemy. And we're off. But what the enemy doesn't know is your limits. I intend to find them, test them, push beyond. Today we'll start with what you only think you know. You show me what you're made of. And then we're off into the dog fighting scene. music. Oh, it is so good. <laughs> But that idea, right? I love that idea. Your enemy knows what's in this book. Yeah. Your enemy knows your strengths, your weaknesses, your cap capabilities. 
because that's what's in the book. Mm -hmm. But God's our creator. God's our designer. And how does he, he knows what we're capable of, right? It, we've, we've used the verse many times. We are God's masterpiece. Workmanship. The word is poema. Built for, to fulfill the purposes of our generation. Built to fulfill the works that he prepared for us ahead of time. The enemy knows our capabilities. But God knows what we're capable of. I like the way you put that. But the only way to reveal, and, and I think I've said this a few times, I don't know how much I can lift if I'm lifting weights. And I, I, if, that's a big if these days. <laughs> 12 ounce curls. <laughs> yes. If I'm lifting weights, I don't know what I can lift unless I lift more than I'm capable of lifting. Right. If I'm benching 50 pounds, I can... You know, maybe I can do 100 reps. I don't know. I'm throwing numbers out there that make no sense. But it's only when I lift something heavier than I lift that I know my limits. And it's only when we go beyond our limits that God steps in. If we're still, like we see Rooster, he's go, he goes slow through the, through the course in the movie. He's, he makes it to the target because he's not pushing himself to the limits. But that's sort of the problem. You've got to push yourself to the limits to know what you're capable of. Yeah. And I think you bring up a really good point, right? Which is, um, you know, when, when you're pushing yourself to get better so that way you can drive through traffic more efficiently and effectively, <laughs> you know, you're always trying to figure out, you know, what you could have done. I that made it home in 42 minutes. Oh, That's man. a new world record. So good. It was during rush hour. <laughs> but you're right. You know, I mean, we're, we're given, if you give two carpenters the exact same pieces of wood and tell them to build a chair, they're going to do it differently because they're going to have their own. Uh, methods, even though they might have the same tools at their dispo uh, disposal. Yeah. That they're, well, they're look at all the, the popularity of the cooking shows these days. Right. You have all the same ingredients, but what is produced is... Exactly. And I think that's, awesome. that's Tom Cruise's, or not Tom Cruise, really Maverick's whole thing is that he's a Maverick, right? And so yeah. his his whole thing is he wants to keep on pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. And it's like, well, we only need to hit Mach 10. Right. And he, what does he do is he gets up there and he's like, oh, just a little more. Right. And he pushes it just a little more. And how many of us are like that? Exactly. What is it? Uh, uh, Camp Carnegie, one of the richest men in America at the time. It's like, how much is enough? He's like, one more dollar, basically. Yep. It's always a little bit more. Yep. But if that's the case, you're never satisfied. You're never, you never find peace or contentment. Well, they're, they're satisfied by the Delta and the pursuit of the Delta as opposed to the pursuit of the conclusion. Right. Dig into that a little bit. Because I think that's where a little, that's an interesting concept that normally we're like, oh, be content with what you have. But sometimes peace comes in the pursuing. Yeah. So um, one of my favorite heretics, uh, his name was Rob Bell, and he wrote a book called Love Wins. And one of the things I love about this book, and he was, he was a pastor up in like, I think Minnesota, and he was like ostracized for the church after writing this book. But one of the things that he talks about is you know, as Christians, we're called on to pursue Christ every day. We're called on to create a world that Jesus talked about, right? And, you know, there are some Jewish traditions where they don't believe in a heaven or a hell, right? There's not like a destination for once, hey, I've made it, right? Like, oh, okay, I've, 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 I've started a relationship with Jesus and I'm now here and I'm good. I can just I can go ahead and live life however I want because I'm saved and life is like, no, you, you, like you're, I don't want to say earn your salvation, right? But you, you experience your salvation every day and you work through it, you know, your own way. And so you're always going to have the opportunity to pursue what it's like to be, be closer and closer and closer to God. Right. And so, um, you know, Carnegie was always pursuing the activity of making more money. And that, that, that thing was something that brought him joy is, is, is he's like, I don't want to ever cross the finish line. I just want to get a little closer. Right. And I think as Christians, we're called to kind of do something similar. And apparently I'm using capitalism and Jesus's teachings. Well, for, I mean, Paul talks Christ. about it for that reason. I buffet my body. I beat myself so that I can run the race Yeah, as a boxer who fights yep. as a, you know, he talks about being a soldier and be all this stuff about, we think the tendency is to think that we can arrive. And we we talk about this with some frequency here. Yeah. We never really arrive. There's never any, ever a finish point. 
And I think that we talked about this with Maverick. Why are you still a captain? You've been in for how long? You've been, you could be a general by now. You could be a senator by now. And yet you're still where you are. One of life's great mysteries, sir. Right. <laughs> it's not a joke, Maverick. Right. And he's, <laughs> right. But but he but he responds, I think, the perfect way, right? Which is it's not like, hey, I haven't I haven't achieved greatness by becoming a senator. I haven't achieved greatness by becoming an admiral. I have done my calling. I have run my race. This is my purpose. And I think he actually responds to the drone ranger by yeah. saying, I'm where I belong. Yeah. Right. And even though the drone ranger, this guy that has the power to make or break his entire I wish career, we had more Ed Harris in this movie. Right. I he's do so wish fun. that. I wish he would have popped up a little bit more later. Oh, he's great. But you have this you have this moment where where he's like, I'm where I belong. But the sentencing that he receives from the drone ranger and Ed Harris is Hey, you done screwed up. You're going to have one last tour and then you're out of the Navy. We're yeah. done with you. You are not where you belong. Right. You, you don't belong in this Navy. You don't belong here as a pilot. You don't belong here as a captain. You don't belong here as Maverick. You don't belong here as Pete Mitchell. You and your time here is done. And frankly, it should have been done a long time ago. You are not where you belong. And he's like, no, no, I am. And you not go through today, this, sir. Not today, sir. Right. And so you go through this entire movie, right? And at the very end, they're getting ready to launch this last mission. And he's not sure if, if uh, Cyclone, right, the, the three-star admiral is going to kick him out of the Navy. John Ham, John Ham, right? Yeah. Uh, if he's going to kick him out or if he's going to let him run that last, last mission. But what ends up happening is you get Warlock, who is played by... Charlie Purnell. Charlie Purnell. So good. <laughs> and he shows up and Maverick's about to go up this elevator to fight this last battle. And he says, hey, Maverick. And, and he turns around. He says... You're where you belong. And when I saw the movie, I'm like, oh, that gave me such chills. Like, yeah. How often do we fight adversity? And we're, we're, we're doing what we think that we need to be doing. And it's not working out. Or we're taking two steps forward and three steps back. And yet our purpose, our purpose, our pursuit, our walk that we have is something that only we can walk. It's something that only we can do. And it's up to every single one of us to figure out what that looks like. And once we know where we belong, we can fight those battles, right? And we can, we can fight battles that only we can fight. Because we get to a point. And we see this closer to the end. Iceman has died. And he, Maverick goes in. Uh, Cyclone acts like he has a heart for the first time all movies. Like, oh, I'll give you some time off. You've got a lot to grieve. He's like, I don't have time. Another, I, I, I don't think we're going to get into it, but this, this idea that time is our enemy, time is our adversary. And then Iceman talks about, no, time is, you, there's still time. So this concept of time we're not going to get into because, you know, we have limited time. <laughs> but but this idea, I, I want to dive into this idea here that's wrestled with when Cyclops tells when Cyclone is talking to Rogue and uh, yeah, and <laughs> we're going X Men. <laughs> when Cyclone, John Ham's character, is telling Maverick, "Your time here is done. You're done teaching. You weren't on my list. You don't have Iceman now to protect you." Mm -hmm. There's no one backing you. Yep. Now I get to do it my way, the way I wanted to all along. And it's interesting because in Maverick's mind, he's been teaching them how to survive, teaching them what he needs, what they need to do to survive the mission. How to come home. How to come home. But what Cyclone has seen is markedly different in what he's taught them. Take some time, whatever you need. I appreciate that, sir, but there's no time. The mission... No, I'll be taking over the training from here. Sir? We both know you didn't want this job, Captain. Sir, they're not ready. Well, it was your job to get them ready. Sir, they have to believe that this mission can be flown. And all you've managed to do is teach them that it can't. Sir? You're grounded, Captain. Permanently. 
Sir, that is all. I'm sorry. What are you going to do? Ice is gone. What do I still have? You'll have to find a way back on your own. Well, Penny. I'm out. It is over. Pete, if you lost your wingman up there, you keep fighting. You wouldn't just give up. Those are your pilots. If anything happens to them, you will never forgive yourself. I don't know what to do. So my favorite thing about this scene is he he gets fired, right? So he, you don't have what it takes. You're not going with. You're done. Your time in the Navy is, is complete. You're out of here, right? And so he, he goes, and this is the world talking to him. You don't have what it takes. And then he goes over and he talks to his lady friend. And she says, hey, you need to find a way. And what happens right after this scene is he steals an F-18. <laughs> Life uh, finds a way. He just finds a way. <laughs> so he goes over and he steals an F-18. He goes to the range that he's been using to try to train these uh, these pilots on how to run this mission. And none of them have been able to make mission parameters. They're not fast enough. They're not able to hit their target. They're not climbing with enough Gs. Whatever, right? And so Maverick shows up. And All you've done is show them that it can't be done. Exactly. And so then Maverick shows up in the same quality that blew up a Death Star? No. Night Star? Dark Star. A Dark, Dark Star. Star. Yeah. <laughs> the, the same... <laughs> well, different movie. <laughs> the same quality that blew up the the Dark Star, right? Because he's like, oh, just a little further. Like that ego stepping in, like, I can do just a little bit more, right? That same, that same quality that he has that had negative ramifications all of a sudden comes to light in him and he's able to demonstrate something and inspire people in a way that he hasn't been able to do before by using this thing that only he can do because only he has the training and experience and only he has this path, right? And so he, he, he steals this plane. He runs the course in two minutes and 15 seconds or 30 seconds. I forget exactly yeah, 15. how. 15. 215. Yeah. Uh, he runs at 660 knots, which is important because 666 knots is the speed of sound. And so he's going six miles an hour or six knots less than what would and cause it's the a mark of the boom. beast. It is, it is the mark <laughs> of the beast. <laughs> and so he's going six, six knots less than what would... Um, create a shockwave and alert yeah. people that he's there, right? And so he's going as fast as he can go. He goes to the course. He hits the first, uh, the first vertical, comes back down, drops the bomb. And instead of having a, an F variant where he's got a Rio that can like guide the JDAM and blow up the, uh, uh, guide the bomb and blow up the, the target. What he just said was he doesn't have a guy behind him putting a laser on the target to guide the bomb in. He had to do it himself. Words are hard. <laughs> <laughs> So, so he goes through and he does this entire mission, which is supposed to be with three people in two planes. And he does the entire thing himself to demonstrate that it's possible to do it with one person. And he almost passes out in the process, but he gets a bullseye and he shows them, right? It's 10 G's. 10 G's, right? And so he, he's able to, the same thing that blew up the dark star, which is his ego, is now being used in a godly way. It's now being used in a way that's able to show others of what, of what the possibilities could be, right? Of what it's like to live a life where you can do this. And for me, that's really inspiring because I feel like as, as Christians, it's really hard to, to lead an inspired life. And you, you have to constantly look for it and find ways that you can engage with people and talk to people and, uh, and show them, right? And, and, and how much of Christianity is not like, hey, took a look at my, my pamphlet and read my, my, my little note or notebook or whatever it is that you give people, right? And like Jesus was like, hey, Follow me. Come live my life. Yeah. Come experience life with me. Come on, let's go. I'm going to show you, right? And I feel like so much of Christianity is not shown through behaviors, but shown through an attitude of the heart and showing people who you are and what your character is and what you're made of and what it means to love people and what it means to, to engage with people. And so he takes this group of pilots who are already above, underwater, right? They're, they're out of their depth. And he's like, okay, this thing that I'm asking you to do is possible. And I have the skill. I have the experience. I have the ego that I'm going to freaking show you how that's done because while I want to lead you guys to success, 
I'm I'm still, you know, Jason and Jason and the Argonauts, right? Or Perseus, right? I'm still <laughs> the guy that's in charge that's leading you guys into battle and we're going to win and we're going to get this place. And so I think he does a really good job and I think it's really fun to watch that scene. And I feel like when we saw it in the theater, like that scene ends and that was one of the few scenes that was actually exceptional in the 40. Uh, yeah. That was, that was really fun. Because it was only one plane. We weren't being jerked back and forth between like three different planes. Oh, the context switching was so bad in 40. But on this one, like it was a really fun scene because you got to move around and like when the scene ends and everyone, uh, what's his name? Uh, Hangman. He's like, man, <laughs> like, <laughs> like I didn't think that this was possible, but I was going to humor yeah. him. And then he's like, oh no, it's, that's possible. You know, the more I've watched this, the more I like Hangman I as a character. I freaking love Hangman. But the interesting thing is, what is, I, I love what John Hamm says. So far you've shown them that they can't do it. Mm-hmm. They're not ready. It was your job to get them ready. All these things are true. Like as a teacher, and, and uh, the we've we have purposely and intentionally not discussed that scene with Iceman very much. We are going to go into a bit more of a deep dive on our YouTube channel at Minute the Movies on YouTube. So check that out. We're going to go because one, it's a visual scene because you know. Ice, ice man's typing but there's so much to it that uh we just we kind of want to hit some of those points there a, a little bit differently so we're not talking about it here but what ice man says is you need to teach them then teach him and what maverick what many of us struggle to do is to teach how do we teach how do we teach not what we do but who we are mm, very strong. similar what what because what what Gandhi is reported saying, I like your Christ very much. It's the Christians who don't look like Christ very mm, much. Yep. And C.S. Lewis talks about our job, our role is to become little Christ. What Maverick does in this scene is say, these parameters that I've set, it can be done. Because all along, all you've done is show them they can't do it. Right. As a as a nursing, as a clinical instructor for nursing students. It's interesting because, and as a manager who's hired new grad nurses, they come in with a severe uh, confidence problem. All they've heard for all their years of nursing school is you don't know what you're doing. Don't kill somebody. Don't screw it up. But you don't know what you're over and over. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know enough. You, my approach with them is the information's in your head. Mm-hmm. You just haven't made those connections yet. And by what Maverick does, and by the way, what Jesus does is enter into our lives and show us how to do it. We don't, you know, what is, what does the writer of Hebrews say? We have a great high priest who has been tempted just like us in every way, Yeah. but Jesus has shown us how to live this life. And now we just have to, as, as Brewster and Phoenix and who, uh, I can't remember who the payback. Is that the other there, guy, yeah. the other pilot of the, the team? All we have to do is follow his lead. Yep. Yeah, it's 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 so strong. And I think you you put it really, really well, right? And I I think I think when you're willing to engage and go down a path and invest in people, uh, you're gonna see remarkable results, right? Because that's that's what Jesus did. And I don't mean results like, oh, you're gonna have so many more followers on YouTube <laughs> or so many more people on your Instagram page. It's like, no, you're you're gonna you're gonna be able to engage with people in a very different way when you're engaging life as opposed to engaging with sin. I mean, I feel like and I I wasn't around to critique this era of preaching, but I feel like in the eighties and nineties there were a lot of fire and brimstone kind of pastors where it's like, hey, here's the mark. And if you don't hit this, then you're gonna you're gonna rot in hell forever. And so I saw this that's why you should be a Christian. I saw this thing on Facebook that said uh, the the view of a Calvinist and it was a picture of a Dunkin' Donuts box. Okay. And the Dunkin' Donuts box said, you deserve a donut. But they had crossed out a donut and written wrath. I was like, yeah, that's kind of what I remember of church growing up is you deserve wrath. Right. <laughs> you, you don't deserve the goodness of Jesus. You right? don't deserve the goodness of a, of a, of a, of a life filled with compassion and, and, uh, and love. Which Every you, which, thought is a sin filled, whatever. It's, and you're just like, yeah. And I think all you've done is show them they can't do it. 
But if you think about it, I mean, that's that's the Bible, right? I mean, we talked about it a second ago, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Yeah. And I feel like the first half of this movie, when they're doing the training, you know, he's showing them what the mark is and why they're missing it. You know, and then he, he, he gets... Explain that to their families. Why are they dead? Why are they dead? Not great motivational speeches there, Mav. Nope. Nope. But it's what he experienced, right? Which they right. haven't. Right. And so, you know, with him having to talk to Meg Ryan in the, in the first movie when right. Goose dies. But he, you have this moment where he's able to show them, he's able to engage with them, he's able to lead them, right? And so the, for me, you know, one of the common themes in the Old Testament is here's the law and here's why you don't, here's why you don't measure them up and here's why you'll never measure up. And that's why we've got to kill things and shed blood in order to make this work, <laughs> right? And then, and then you, you have Jesus enter into our, our story and when he comes, he says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change this, right? Instead of, instead of it being, hey, you don't measure up and you're going to have to kill stuff because you're never going to be good enough. I want you to know that if you, you know, believe with your heart, confess with your mouth, and you join me on this walk, what will end up happening is not that you're going to lead a life of you're never good enough, but instead you're going to live a life where you can live it abundantly, you can live it fully, you can live it with uh, passion. And... More than you can ask or imagine. Exactly. And I feel like that's that's the turning point, right? Yeah, super does weird. We just compared Tom Cruise to Jesus. I mean, hey, it's been a couple thousand years. It's all right to have some other <laughs> things to look up to. Just we saying. pushed the envelope, just yeah. like... Just like Mav pushes the envelope of his F-18, right, we push we the envelopes of theology. These are the stories that we got, man. That's, that's, <laughs> that's what we got. Jesus would have told this parable, but they didn't have this back then, okay? Right. They didn't have, you know, uh, the, the Atmos, Dolby Atmos, where you could hear the planes flying overhead <laughs> or the 3D, the 4D seat movings in the movies. Right. <laughs> that's awesome. So this whole conversation has revolved around this idea of it's not the plane, it's the pilot. Mm-hmm. And what, I guess the, the question, what pilot are we following? What pilot are we emulating? Again, not super weird spiritualizing it, but the idea that we are capable of more than is in the manual, of more than what the world tells us we are. But when we trust to, the question is, who are we following? Who are we trusting? Are we trusting the pilot who shows us how to, to do it? Are we trusting what we see? Are we trusting Are we trusting our preconceived ideas of what it means to be a Christian or a man or a father or a husband? You know, you bring up a good point, though. Um, so I, I work in corporate America, and I have to coach um, uh, people that are right out of school and they're brand new resources. And one of the activities that I have them do in the first year that they're working with my firm is I tell them, whatever you're doing, I want you to pick somebody and on a weekly basis, you're going to keep a tab on one thing that they did exceptionally and one thing that was just trash and you don't want to do that, right? And they can be the same person, they can be different people, they can be situations, whatever, but I want you to take a note of that. And then what we're going to do is we're going to work on ways that you can either emulate that behavior or make sure that behavior doesn't happen at all for you. And so how do we like create guardrails so that we don't make those mistakes or we create a, a, a path where you can start to emulate those behaviors and do better, do better. And I feel like as Christians, we don't really do that a whole lot. Right. I'm, I don't know. And just kind of thinking about myself as a younger man, I don't know about me looking up to other Christians and thinking like, man, Jesus isn't here, but I feel like that guy looks a lot like him. And I feel like if, if I were to, if I were to go down the path with that guy, I'd, I'd probably learn a lot. Right. There's not a lot of men that have mentors or have friends that will help kind of guide them down that path. There's not a lot of people that choose to engage that way. And so, you know, I, I happen to have a group of men that I engage with, and I'm exceptionally thankful that I have them uh, to do that with, but I don't feel like everyone has that. And so as Christians, I think it's important that we engage. It's important that we have people that we can act, interact with that will, that will make us better, stronger, uh, more in line, help us, you know, point down the path. I mean, that's what, again, Jesus said, all authority has been given. Now go and make disciples. And that's not go and make Christians. It's not go and make believers. It's go and make disciples, people who follow. And that's what these, this special detachment in this movie, they're disci they become disciples of Mav, but not until he shows them the way. Like how much better would it have been if, Instead of the first day showing them what they can't do, he shows them 
the way. Shoot, were there 12 of them? I'm actually thinking back. Was that 12 there pilots? There were 12. Stop yes. it. See, this is what I'm talking about, man. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> Jeez, that's amazing. But he, if he goes and says, here, I'm going to show you how to do it. Now do it like me. But because Maverick, I'm a pilot, I'm not a teacher. But weirdly, he doesn't trust what he is. Like if he says, I'm a pilot, my spot is here. He would show them how to do it. So they could believe it could be done. There's a, um, there's a, a Greek word that I love. And there's a, a pastor that wrote a book about it named Craig Rochelle. And it's called Cazone, C-H-A-Z-O-W-N. And the book is... Not cojones. Not, not it's not uh, cojones. No, okay. <laughs> uh, but it's... Cazone is a Hebrew word, and I believe it actually translates literally to like vision. And the point of the book is that when God's will for your life and your will for your life line up going the same direction, amazing things happen. Yeah. There's a lot of times that we have our own will for our life. And there's a lot of times that we go down that and I'm like, cool, but we're, we may not living, we may not be living within our purpose. And we're the, not in step with the spirit. We're not in step. Moments. We're not in sync, right? We're in it, step with our spirit. We're right. And so <laughs> when you align kind of your will for your life with what God's will for your life is, amazing things happen. And I think that dovetails perfectly into what we're talking about here, right? Where when you realign, things happen. Yeah. And it's about realigning and saying, oh, this can be done. Yes. We say, oh, we, we do have somebody who shows us how to do it. Right. Who... Because again, it's not the plane, it's the pilot. Yes. And the, the pa- plane, like we never see a plane pushed beyond its limits. The pilots, yes. You know, the, what is it, that guy that passes out and. Ten of the Dark Star was pushed beyond its limits. Okay. Just saying. You're right. I'm sorry. Just right. Keep the plane gets pushed beyond its yes. limits. Yeah. But in the training program, in the detachment. Technically that one guy passes out. Right. He passes out. Yeah. Maybe the bird splatter. Yeah. That's more like a how you respond thing. Right. But it's not the plane. It's the pilot. It is the pilot. It's how you respond to it. It's what, it's what you do with your situation and your tools that you have. Right. So. Oh yeah. Go ahead. No, that was good. Keep going. So your situation is where you're placed, right? It's where you are at today. It's, it's, it's your world, right? It's the same reason why you're going to have a much different impact than any pastor on the pulpit because while that guy shows up on Saturday and he manages or Saturday and Sunday and he manages the staff to to minister to people, he can't be or she can't be everywhere at all times. And so we as Christians, we have our own situations that we're put in where we're called to be ministers and we're called to engage, right? And maybe that's work, maybe it's your football team, maybe it's your kids' little league team, maybe it's your softball league, maybe it's your D and D group that you see on Saturday mornings. Maybe it, it could be anything, right? Whatever, whatever it is that your passion is about, you know, that's going to be your situation. But then only you can play the part that you need to play to engage with people in order to uh, live a life that glorifies God and, and shows people God's love, right? Only you can do that. Only you can play that part. And so Maverick, you know, he's got all of these different roles that he's played, right? Test pilot, fighter pilot, trainer, whatever, right? Uh, doing air to ground missions in Bosnia. Or, I think they mentioned some stuff in this movie, right? right. Uh, so he's going to have all kinds of, you know, different situations that he's been in, different parts that he's played. He's always been the same person and how he responds to those situations depends on what the mission is at hand, right? And that's going to be different for every one of those situations that you find find yourself in, right? So, uh, but who he is doesn't change. And I think that's really powerful. And that feels like a pretty good place to pause. We have a couple more topics and themes to discuss, but we're going to save that for part two of this conversation. But the idea, it's not the plane, it's the pilot. How has your situation dictated your response? And how can you become the pilot, pushing your capabilities and seeing God do what feels impossible? And the idea that all you've done is show them that it can't be done. You are where you are for a purpose, not to teach, but to live, to show, to do. So who are you following? Who are you listening to and walking alongside? And then where are they taking you? What are they showing you to do? And then in the other direction, who are you reflecting your heart to? Who are you inviting into your life? And what do they see? Are you showing them how to live a life in impossible situations? 
or showing them that it can't be done. So this has been Paul McDonald and Andreas Werner talking about Top Gun Maverick. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you join us next week for part two here on the Men at the Movies podcast. Something inside has been awakened. I can no longer be who I was before. But if I am no longer who I was, who am I to be? Who am I to be?